Hello there and welcome to the final of these video guides to The Woman in Black. And this last one is going to be about trying to put this knowledge in context of how you might tackle an exam question, specifically an edXL GCSE syllabus exam question. But I'm going to make this broad enough that it, it genuinely doesn't matter which exam board that you are covering, there should be something in here for you to take away. So I'm going to cover three, uh, sorry, four broad areas. Number one, question focus, then planning, looking at your opening paragraph and writing analytical paragraphs. Now we do the Edexcel syllabus and there is a distinct focus in these questions about the modern novel or play. However, broadly, the things we talk about should apply to not just this uh, this text, but any text across any syllabus. So the first thing we're going to talk about really is question focus. Now, the way the question is structured on the edXL exam is that you are given a fairly broad question to look at and only a single quotation that illustrates that question. And the book is, a, and remember this is a closed book exam. If you've got a 12 chapter novel, but you don't have that with you and you've got one short quotation to handle. And that has a number of implications, not, not least of which is that you really do need to know the novel extremely well. You need to know what happens and where. So the first point to make before even thinking about how to answer the question is making sure that you really do know the, the novel very well. And that's why I've gone to the extent of producing the guide in the form of the presentation, but also in the form of these videos to help students get to grips with what happens and where and the techniques that are involved, because you have to carry that with you. Now that doesn't mean that this is an exhaustive memory test. You're not being expected to have quotations off by heart be really useful if you have got a few. But the other thing this means is, is that you've got a very broad question, which means that you need to know what the question is trying to get you to do so you can match what you do to what the question is asking. And that is true no matter which exam board you're taking and really which question you're answering, be it literature or language, or even any other essay-based subject. You need to understand what the focus of your question is and how best to address that. Um, with literature, broadly speaking, you're, you're kind of going to be asked to do just a handful of things. The first thing is, do you understand the text? Do you know what happens? Do you understand what the author is trying to say? Do you understand how they're saying it? What techniques they are using to do that? And can you link this back to how an audience might react? So let's have a quick look at a sample question. As I say, this is an Edexcel style question. This is one of their exemplar questions that they produced at the start of this particular syllabus. And here we've got this short quotation. Well, he said, at last you've come a long way since the night I met you on the late train. It feels like a hundred years ago, I feel like another man. So this is a, uh, a quotation and you should be able to place this quotation. It's from chapter 11 a packet of letters. So here we have a quotation which is focusing on the character of Arthur Kipps. And you should be able to identify that the first line is actually Samuel Daly speaking, and the second line is Arthur Kipps. And the question says, in, which, in what ways is Arthur Kipps changed by the event in The Woman in Black, you must refer to context, the context of the novel in your answer. So that's an Edexcel question and, and context is really important for The Woman in Black. Now we've said, if you look at the very first video, the context and background video, that context can feel like a bit of a struggle with this novel, which is not anchored in a specific time period, although it's clearly referencing Victorian Edwardian social conditions and isn't written in a time when there's a kind of historical political 
situation that really speaks to the elements that are in the novel although there are ways to interpret it like that but that gets quite complicated so really your your kind of contextual things can be those social issues that are addressed in the novel but of course obviously the literary traditions within which this is working and that's a way to address the context so we are given a thematic focus though how does Arthur change and that contextual assessment focus is foregrounded for us so we can use our question to draw out some of that question focus we can look at okay we now need to talk about change how does Arthur change specifically we're focusing on that one character well there aren't too many other characters you could write a lot about it in this novel to be fair and we know we've got to reference the context the missing elements are the ones that we need to understand that are always implied can we interpret ideas can we express our ideas about the text can we talk about how an, an audience will react? So it's coming back to these points up here. So knowing that we've got that, we know actually in advance how we need to structure some of our responses. Now, in structuring it, I think the next element that is really important is planning. Now, I do talk about this fairly incessantly with my classes, and I frequently insist that planning is included, even though and you'll always get asked this question as a teacher is the planning mark the answer is no but planned responses are always better there's statistical evidence to prove the fact the exam board actually conducted um, a, a, an albeit limited analysis but they discovered that the pieces of work they looked at that were planned were all proportionately much higher up the mark schemes correlatory or causal uh, or, or causality that you could argue but honestly planning does make a difference particularly with regards to a big broad question like this it's going to keep you focused and allow what allow you to do what you need to do in the time given so it's going to allow you to understand what you're being asked and planning then will help you respond Otherwise, you run the risk of rambling. You run the risk of losing focus on those assessment objectives. Your plan doesn't need to be extensive. I mean, you recognize this is time conditions, but it should illustrate the points you want to cover and have reminders of these assessment objectives, those key things that you need to focus on to get the marks. So let's just have a look. I did a quick example here. So again, it should be light because your time in a time sensitive situation you're time constrained you're not writing an extensive a3 mind map here you are jotting down enough ideas that you will have your kind of your paragraph starters plus a couple of reminders of the things that you need to keep back coming back to to get those marks so i'd start with the question and i pick out my examples i'm going to write about so in what ways is arthur change so i would pick out the idea that he's changed um by his beliefs are changed he starts off as the rational protagonist getting a point in there about literary context of course about how the rational protagonist is a, a trope of um gothic horror and of ghost stories we need rational protagonists because people who believe in the supernatural tend to avoid haunted places um but arthur starts as the rational protagonist and comes through that to, to a belief in the supernatural and then i'd get down my points that i would use to illustrate this so chapter four where he's dismissing the locals um where he goes through the transformative uh uh, events where he realizes there's something supernatural going on but still dismisses it and tries to apply his rationality to it so in chapter seven and eight uh where he tells mr jerome he should face it out and he refuses to be warned off by mr daly chapter uh 10 uh, even after the haunting in the nursery which is clearly supernatural he f he he lies in bed and thinks to himself oh well the the sound can't hurt me and then chapter 11 and a final attempt to kind of rationalize what's going on he looks to see if someone's broken into the nursery and about and, and uh, wrecked the room um we could even talk and then i would go on to talk about his physical uh, emotional and psychological changes um the fact that we can even talk about the fact that he's physically damaged and emotionally damaged by what goes on so chapter one references to the nervous illnesses chapter six needing to be rescued um the physical and psychological collapse that occurs in chapter 11 and the kind of broken man we're left with in chapter 12 uh and you know maybe even the ultimate demise of arthur as a result of retelling his story 
I'd also like to just throw in there something about maybe some positive changes um, that it becomes more humble, more grateful. Um, but of course, sadly, it's ultimately to no avail if, if the hints about how this story truly ends are, are kind of accurate. And throughout this, I'm going to need to remind myself, right, context. We've got the rational protagonist, the gothic Gogh story, context, social attitudes towards class, because Arthur, of course, is from London. And then the author's aim is to create shock and horror and emotional impact. So good, right, this is my plan. I've got my points here, and I've got my reminders here. We can start writing. And, you know, that doesn't have, this is possibly more detailed than you, you might do in an exam, but it's an idea of jotting down the things I want to say, the points of the novel I want to reference, and the key things I need to remember to pick up the marks. Just a final word on planning. There is no set way to plan. Uh, your teachers will teach you individual ways and you'll have your own way of doing things. But planning is important, particularly with a question that's as open-ended as the one that you get from Edexcel on the modern novel or play. Planning is going to allow you to make sure that you know what you want to write. You're not going to have to spend 20 minutes in the middle of the task thinking about what to do next because you've spent five minutes at the start jotting your ideas down. So you'll know you've got your paragraph, you've got your paragraph starters there and you can just rattle on through them. So let's just have a look at opening paragraphs. Now, normally, if we were dealing with, say, an extract based question or one of the short uh, language questions, uh, the, the language exam where you've got uh, 15, 20 minutes to read and analyze a text, you know, you'd be talking about piling straight in. However, this is a bigger question. This is something that maybe involves a bit more shaping. So I would write an opening paragraph that has a particular focus and structure that shows that I've conceptualized my response. So I've thought about it in advance. I know where I'm going to start and I'm going to end. Having a plan will allow you to do that. And the, this opening paragraph is going to indicate the main thrust. It's going to show where I'm headed with the essay. And the rest of the essay is going to be there to exemplify my points. I'm not necessarily sure I would throw in a conclusion given the time constraints of this exam. I would want to try and get my last point in there. But if you have, you know, then, then you've got that structure of being able to find a final conclusive point. Let's just have a look at um, an example of an opening paragraph. So Arthur Kipps is profoundly changed by the events he describes in the narrative. Hill presents, so I, I, this is really, really important. Okay, guys, no matter what you are doing, no matter which topic, no matter which question, no matter which exam board, always come back to referencing the author and do it by surname first. It's really weird if you call Susan Hill, Susan, throughout the, uh, the essay. You're not on first name terms. The convention is that we refer to the author by their surname. So Hill presents, Arthur's transformation as a physical, emotional, and psychological journey. So I'm ticking off those things that I'm going to talk about, and I'll talk about the physical, emotional, psychological things that change, leaving him broken but wiser, throwing in there the negative but the positive. So you can see I've kind of encapsulated everything I was talking about in my planning. Although, as we see at the end of the novel, Arthur is still unable to escape from his own past, and it consumes him just as the past consumed Jeanette Humphrey. Just thought that was a really nice point to make as I was going through. And I can throw that out there. I'm not necessarily going to explore that. I am just throwing that out there as a, as a, as a thing to say, look, I recognize that there's some parallels between these two characters. But the important stuff is that I'm talking about here, the fact that we've got this journey that he goes on. He's changed under these circumstances. But there are some things that come out of it that are positive. So let's now have a look at how to write a focused analytical paragraph, because this is where you pick up the marks. So you, you will have been taught at various stages in your school careers by various teachers at various levels, paragraph structures from P, Peter, Pele, Peel paragraphs, you name it. There'll be an acronym there, but the acronym is there just to remind you of the things you need to put into a piece of literary analysis. The acronym is almost irrelevant as long as you include the elements that it refers to. Uh, we left behind the P points because we did feel that we needed a bit more than just explain. And we, we, um, we, we use Peter paragraphs, which refer to point, evidence, technique, explanation, and reader, effect on reader. So all 
paragraphs, regardless of the acronym, have some key elements. And the first thing is a point. You need a, a point that links back to the question that you've been asked. You have to supply evidence. Now, that could be in the form of a quotation or a specific textual reference. That might just be, you know, in this chapter, this happens, particularly with closed book exams where you aren't given an extract. You're not expected to do a detailed linguistic analysis. You're not expected to say, oh, the use of the comma in this sentence, because who knows whether you know where that comma is and who's going to go about remembering that stuff. But having a knowledge of, okay, I know that the writer uses this technique at this point, that is a specific textual reference that will do. A few good quotations in the back pocket are always handy. Explanation, you need to be able to unpick it. Say, what's the writer doing? Why? How does it work? And this has to come back to this initial point. So the explanation has to elucidate, add, expand upon the thing that you're saying. Why is the writer doing this? Always come back to the writer. And it's useful to be able to throw in there some understanding about the technique. Now, yes, the language analysis assessment objective is not explicitly marked in this exam for Edexcel. However, it's good knowledge and AO1 interpretation if you've got it. Okay, it's just good practice. And don't forget the reader that the author is doing something to somebody. They're doing something to their audience. Always come back to the reader. And of course, as we said in the case of Edexcel, we've got to weave context into this. And what you want to do with an analytical paragraph is have all of these elements in. Now, the order that you do them in, the thing about these uh, acronyms is you feel like you have to make the, the, the paragraphs fit that order. And in many cases they do, but it's not absolutely necessary that they follow that specific order. You might end up moving some of those elements around depending on which order you're writing the points in. Again, whatever it is that you have been taught, that's what you need to use. Whatever works for you, that's what you do. Okay. So yes, there were some uh, examples of various acronyms on the previous slide, but you use whichever ones you've been taught and you know you can make work. So here's an example paragraph. I'm not going to read the whole thing out to you, but I'm going to show where the different elements have fit into this. Um, and they do kind of loosely fall into the Peter paragraph structure. That's just because that's the one that, that we tend to work with. So I mentioned Arthur's attitudes and how they change. And that's an example of me making the main point. He talks about, and I talk about how he starts here and then he finishes here kind of a bit closer uh, to the people of Crith and Gifford. Um, I expand on that because uh, the, the best example of this is his friendship with uh, Mr. Daly and how Arthur ends up having Mr. Daly as his son's godfather uh, for, the, for the brief time that his son is alive. Um, but we also, you know, I, 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 what I'm trying to do here is show chapter referencing. So his attitudes change dramatically during chapter eight when he goes to dinner with him, his openness and generosity when Arthur are over. And his chapters 10 to 12 will be learned of Arthur's rescue and the subsequent friendship. Yeah, so here I'm, I'm showing that. I, look, I know where these things happen. Here are the chapters where it happens. I haven't gone for a direct quotation here. Um, I didn't need one, but I have slipped a direct quotation in there where I've got that idea of the Londoner's sense of superiority. So I've got a bit of evidence in that section. Um, here, I'm going to make a contextual point. Arthur's initial arrogance represents the London-centric and class-orientated views of the Victorian Edward, Edwardian era. And I've even kind of posited that maybe we still have quite a London-centric view in our society today. You know, a lot of how we go about setting broad policy, you could argue, is dictated by the fact that it's what fits with London. And people have a very kind of like, they, they you know, London is seen to be a representation of England at large, when in fact, actually, it's a much more diverse place than this. So the contextual point being thrown in there. Um, I mentioned the first person narrative, which allows Hill. And again, I've mentioned Hill again by name in here, deliberately to show that I'm aware there's a, a, a writer at work. Uh, but I've thrown in how she does this. So this is, again, arguably part of the explanation, but I'm also talking about 
the narrative perspective which allows Arthur to highlight the changes kind of talk about and reflect on his own emotional journey so keeping again focused back on the idea of changes here and a reference to the reader so the reader is drawn into Arthur's musings as we empathize with the older wiser Arthur who can clearly see the errors of his own errors when reflecting on his past so again talking about the idea of changing the idea that he's the old Arthur thinking about how he was and going back into change so there you have it an approach to dealing with the exam questions like I said there are multiple ways that you'll have been shown how to do this this structure here is just one way but these key elements here are really really important and this is the sort of thing that we need to see woven throughout your responses when coming into the exam for this particular novel and again more broadly throughout all of your literature responses hope you found this useful thank you very much for listening bye bye